Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Shoals Marine Lab's weekly marine seminar series. And I'm Jennifer Seavey, the executive director at Shoals. And for all of you who are not familiar, Shoals is the largest and the oldest undergraduate focused marine lab in the country. It's an institution of both the University of New Hampshire and Cornell. We are located on Appledore Island, which is in the Isles of Shoals off uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, about 10 miles out. And we also have offices at UNH and at Cornell. Um, this series will run through the end of this year, and it's designed to bring the Shoals Marine Lab community together to learn, to discuss, and hopefully develop new ideas for marine science and conservation. So our format tonight is a 45-minute talk, followed by a 15-minute uh, questions and answers. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, type in your question, and I will read it to Maya at the end of her talk. Um, so tonight, I'm really excited to have Dr. Maya DeVries with us. And she is an assistant professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at San Jose State University in California. Her lab integrates tools in animal behavior, biomechanics, stable isotope ecology, and engineering to uncover how morphological feeding specializations contribute to trophic dynamics and ecosystem function. She also is interested in determining how global change will alter these form function relationships. She has an undergraduate degree from the University of California at Davis in evolution and ecology and she has a PhD in integrative biology from UC Berkeley. So tonight, Maya will be talking to us about trophic relationships in the benthos, feeding morphology and ecology of macroinvertebrates. So welcome, Maya, you can join us. Excellent, so glad to have you here. Thank you for, for agreeing to give this talk and I'm gonna hand the, the virtual mic to you. Great, thank you so much. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, and thank you for the invitation to speak to the Shoals Marine Lab community. I'm really excited to tell you all about my research. Um, so first, I wanna start by showing you um, this photograph of a mantis shrimp that is um, that is lunging out of its sandy burrow in order to capture this damselfish prey. So it is unfurling its spear-like appendages and it has all these cool morphologies here on its appendage for capturing invasive fish prey. And, all, and this is a really good example of the link we see between form and function. Um, and these are the kinds of questions that guide my work. How do these individual feeding specializations kind of drive ecosystem function? Um, because this animal is doing something that we all have to do, which is consume food. We all have to eat in order to get energy to survive so we can understand how animals get energy and how that relates to the ecology of an ecosystem. So um, mantis shrimp or stomatopod crustaceans are about 500, they're about 500 extant species. They're tropical and subtropical. They have these raptorial appendages or predatory appendages that move extremely fast. And this is a specialized feeding morphology. And so, um, I learned really early in my grad, graduate school career that these animals were really an excellent system for trying to understand relationships between um, what animals eat and how that relates to their ecology. Um, and what I'm going to tell you today is that these animals are actually quite surprising in their trophic ecology and they influence their environment in ways that we hadn't expected. Many mantis shrimp live on coral reefs. Um, so um, you wouldn't know it from looking at this picture, but this coral reefs are incredibly diverse habitats. They occupy about less than 1% of the ocean floor, and yet they, we think they're home to about 25% of all marine species, or all species on Earth, actually, so incredibly biodiverse. Um, 
And so all of these organisms that are living in this environment are interacting with one another. They're all consuming prey and competing with one another. Um, and they're also all living in an environment that is rapidly changing. And so the reefs under themselves are undergoing unprecedented change and many of them are dying and are unable to recover. And so given the importance of the many organisms on reefs and habitats in general, my perspective is that we can't understand ecosystem function without understanding morphology on the individual level. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today. Specifically, we're gonna answer these two primary questions. How do morphological feeding specializations contribute to trophic dynamics and ecosystem function? And how do environmental disturbances influence trophic relationships? And so we're kind of looking at trophic interactions from both the feeding interactions and the environment perspective. Um, but first I want to kind of put this in a broader perspective. Um, so there are these really classic ideas in functional morphology and ecology, and that's that um, highly specialized morphology um, used for feeding can lead to a narrow diet. So here are really two classic examples of this um, that are not marine. Um, but this is the proboscis of the columbine nectar spur that precisely fits into the columbine flower. Oops. And this is the jaw of the egg eating snake that can actually expand to at least twice the width of its head in order to engulf an egg. And so these have become classic examples of how we understand the tight link between form and function where morphological specialization is thought to narrow diet, allowing these animals to only eat these specific prey. Here's another classic example. These are the Galapagos finches that probably look familiar to some of you. Um, there is the small, medium, and large ground finches that all consume seeds of small, medium, and large varieties. They, um, there are also finches that have specialized beaks for consuming cactuses, eating insects. Um, there's even a woodpecker finch. Um, and so what we've learned from Dar Darwin's finches or the Galapagos finches is that there's also this really envi important environmental component that drives the abundances of these different species in the wild. And so here is an example. This is work done by Peter and Rosemary Grant back in the 70s, but it's really kind of seminal work for understanding form function relationships. They found that if you measure the beak depth, um, and if you measure the distribution of beak depth over time, um, they actually saw that um, generally beak depths were around this mean here between kind of nine and 10 millimeters. But then there was actually a big drought in the late 70s and that led to a shift in beak size because all of these smaller um, ground finches were going extinct because they were unable to consume the um, larger seeds and, uh, that were available. So all of the small, smaller seeds were consumed and only the large were available. So only the large ground finch could consume those. And that shifted the morphology that we see in finches. And so it shows us how environment can really drive ecological change. Um, so again, we're going to be looking at stomatopod crustaceans. They've become um, quite famous in the media. Maybe some of you are familiar with this comic. This is called, this is from the oatmeal. If you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend that you look it up. Um, but they become really famous because they have this incredible morphology for consuming different prey. Um, so I actually have an example, a video of a mantis shrimp doing exactly this. It's smashing the claw off of a crab. Um, and I think it might take here a second to load. Um, but here we'll see, this is the raptorial appendage or the predatory appendage of mantis shrimp. It's gonna rotate forward and smash the claw off of this emerald crab. Um, and this is actually one of the fastest movements ever reported in the animal kingdom. Um, this appendage is moving about um, 25 meters per second, which is about 50 miles an hour. Um, it's creating accelerations that are comparable to a flying bullet. Um, and it's generating forces that are thousands of times the body weight of the animal. And this is really impressive because it's all happening in water as well. Let's see if we can see it one more time because it's done a better job of loading. 
So that is how this animal smashes the claw and it flies across the tank here. And so the comic that I showed you earlier is actually a really nice illustration of a feeding interaction. And so we can break this down. So we have the raptorial appendage or the predatory appendage, which is the morphology that's used to um, smash the claw off, the, off of this crab. Then we have the feeding interaction itself between the crab and the mantis shrimp. But of course, this is happening on a much smaller scale. So we can reduce it down. This feeding interaction is one of many uh, in a coral reef or anywhere that mantis shrimp live. Um, and so mantis shrimp are consuming all of these prey, but they're also consumed by a variety of other prey. And of course, all of these animals live in an environment or a habitat. And so again, it is my perspective that we can't really understand how the ecosystem really functions without understanding these really important feeding interactions at the morphology and behavior level. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. First, we're gonna focus on feeding interactions. Um, so mantis shrimp, the kind of diversity of 500 species that we see are typically divided into two functional groups. Um, we have the smashers, which I showed you a video of, that have this kind of hammer-like appendage, and they use it, we think, mostly to smash hard-shelled prey. They generate really high forces and accelerations that allow them to smash hard-shelled prey. Um, and then spears have, again, these really elongated appendage appendages. These are the same animals you saw in the first photograph. And they have these amazing spines and other morphologies um, for capturing invasive fish prey, we think. Um, and they're also, um, these appendages are much more hydrodynamic. But again, we uh, really know very little about what these animals are consuming in nature. So here is a smashing mantis shrimp smashing a snail in real time. So you can see, um, in an action in real time, but let's slow it down again. So this is the, another high speed video of a mantis shrimp, slowed down so that we can see it. Its appendage is gonna rotate forward and smash this snail. And you'll actually see two flashes of light in this video, right one upon impact, um, one right upon impact, and then another one about seven seconds later. Um, so here the appendage rotates forward smashes the snail, there's that first flash of light. The second one is gonna come right about here. And basically what's happened, there it was, what's happening in this video is that the appendage is moving so fast through water that it's creating an area of low pressure um, that then creates an air bubble. When that air bubble implodes, it generates energy in the form of light and heat that's comparable to the sun. And that's called cavitation. And that's what you're seeing here. So really an incredible movement. What I like to think, uh, the analogy I like to use for the smashing mantis shrimp is if a smashing mantis shrimp were to throw a baseball, if it were human size and were to throw a baseball, um, that would actually launch that baseball into orbit around the earth. So really an impressive movement. Um, this is the spearing mantis shrimp. So here you see it is lunging out of its sandy burrow to grab this shrimp on a stick. This is real time. Uh, and here we'll slow it down again so you can see it. So uh, this movement is actually much slower than the smashing mantis shrimp. But of course, it's a much different behavior. This animal actually opens the dactyl segment of its appendage, and then it rotates forward the whole appendage rotates forward to capture the snail prey the, or the shrimp on a stick. Um, and so the behavior is quite different. It is much, um, if you notice, the uh, kinematics are much um, slower. They move pathetically slowly compared to smashers. So the velocity is actually um, about 10 times as slow and the linear acceleration is magnitude slower. So here you can see that, um, again, the speed is much slower and so is the acceleration. Um, and we think that's because it's a different behavior, but then also they're just using their appendage differently. I should say that although spheres are much, move much more slowly compared to smashers, their movement is actually comparable to a fish opening its jaw in order to capture prey or a squid tentacle protruding forward to capture prey. So they're really good at capturing invasive prey because they're 
they just need to move faster than that invasive prey. They don't need to move so fast to be able to generate the high accelerations and forces needed to smash hard shell prey. And so all mantis shrimp can produce these fast movements because their rep raptorial appendages actually function as a spring. And so um, here is the appendage. Here's a line diagram of the appendage. This is the appendage, um, what we call loaded. So in this formation. Um, and so when it's loaded, there's actually a latch right here that you can't see, but all of these colored elements are elastic energy storage elements in the exoskeleton itself. And so the muscle contracts, this dotted line represents the muscle, it contracts to load the appendage. And then there's a little latch here that keeps it in place. When that latch releases, all of these elastic elements spring forward, leading the appendage to fly forward at speeds faster than you can see. Um, and it's kind of analogous to if you bend a ruler and let it go. You're putting in a lot of work to bend the ruler, and then when you release it, all that energy is getting released over a short amount of time. Um, so that's how we think managed to produce these amazing strikes. Um, and spears do it a little bit differently than smashers. Um, and so here, um, so that is a little bit about how the morphology works and how the feeding interaction works on the individual level. Um, but how does this work in the broader trophic dynamics? Who's eating whom on a coral reef? Um, we're specifically going to think about what a mantis shrimp eat, because as I mentioned before, um, we know very little about what they're consuming. And so I told you that smashers are super fast and powerful, spears are fast um, and far reaching, so they are able to, to reach a much further distance. Um, smashers consume hard shell prey, we think mostly, and spears consume evasive soft body prey. Smashers are mostly found in these hard substrate coral rubble habitats as well, um, whereas spears are found in these soft substrate sandy muddy habitats. Um, and so hopefully I've convinced you now that mantis shrimp have highly specialized morphology for um, generating these incredibly fast, powerful movements. And so the question is, does this lead to a narrow diet or a wide diet? So does this lead, does this narrow the diet like we see in the animals that we talked about before, like Galapagos finches and um, uh, the egg-eating snake and the hawk moth that have very narrow diets? Or does it broaden their diet and allow them to consume a wider diversity of prey? And this um, is a question that kind of guided a lot of my um, research. And so in order to answer this quest these questions, we have to know what mantis shrimp eat. So I wanted to know, do mantis shrimp have a varied diet? And I specifically focused on smashers because of the, the impressive movement that we talked about before. Um, and so this question seems like it would be easy to answer. It turns out it isn't. So I combined an uh, abundance study and a feeding experiment with a stable isotope analysis of diet to really understand what these animals are eating in the field. Um, and so here is the species that I studied. This animal is about 50 millimeters max, 55 millimeters, so about an inch. Um, but it has an incredibly impressive strike as well. Here you can see it smashing the apex off of this snail. And most of my work was done in, at Galata Marine Laboratory, which is part of the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama. And this is a really neat field site because it has two habitat types that are right next to each other and rep, can replicate plots. So we have coral rubble and seagrass. And so we can really understand diet diversity in mantis shrimp because this species lives in both of these habitats. So we can really understand how wide their diet is. But because this is a coral reef, um, we want to know what they eat, we had to look at all of the possible prey items that mantis shrimp could be eating in order to understand how narrow their diet could be. Um, so to start, we did an abundance study of all the possible prey items in the habitat, and we defined a possible prey item by if an animal was less than um, twice the length of the mantis shrimp. Um, and these were the 12 most common prey items that we found in the field. So we thought that's a good place to start. And this is my undergraduate at the time, um, Lovelli Albert, who is now a PhD student in Japan. Um, but she um, was from the University of Panama, and so she helped me with this work. 
And so here are the results. Um, here are all the prey items. So hard shell prey, soft bodied or, or evasive prey. Um, and these are the number of trials out of 10 in which prey were consumed. And I'm highlighting here the important things to note, um, which are that uh, these alphid snapping shrimp, um, worms and sardines were actually um, the most consumed prey items. Um, and so they are not hard shelled, they are soft bodied. And so this tells us, this indicates that the smashing appendage does not prevent animals from consuming soft body prey. Um, I should say that alphids and brittle stars are in the soft bodied and evasive um, um, category because functionally these um, mantis shrimp consume these animals in the same way that they consume soft body prey. So they would capture them and then they were able to use their maxillopeds to um, get the meat out of the um, out of the prey, whereas any of these other hard shell prey items took a number of smashes to consume and subdue the prey and sort of open the um, prey item for consumption. So that told us what mantis shrimp eat in the lab, but we were really curious about what they eat um, in the field. And so we needed a complete picture of diet breadth over space and time. And so in order to do that, we used stable isotope analysis of diet. Um, so stable isotopes, um, stable isotope analysis works because we can think of the predator as a mixture of all the stable isotopes of its prey. Um, and so I specifically focused on nitrogen 15 and carbon 13. Um, and so there's this kind of idea in ecology that, um, or that we see in stable isotope analysis where with carbon, you are what you eat because generally the carbon values are the same between predator and prey, but with nitrogen, you are what you eat plus three parts per mil because as you go up um, at trophic level, generally there's a three parts per mil difference with nitrogen. And so we call that the discrimination factor, which is kind of the standard difference that you see between predator and prey stable isotope values. And so for my stable isotope analysis of diet, I looked at carbon and nitrogen values of smasher species and analyzed them with their prey. And this was my undergraduate at the time, Julie Hassan, who is now um, a uh, master's student at the University of Michigan, doing some really neat environment um, education work actually. And this, um, and, and so this is my other student, Samantha Liu, and she is in medical school. Um, and she helped me to figure out experimentally derived discrimination factors. And so those of you who are interested in stable isotopes, um, we found the opposite of what you would expect. So we found that with, in mantis shrimp with carbon, you're th you are what you eat plus three parts per mil. And with nitrogen, um, you're pretty much you are what you eat. So that was not expected. And it was really good that we found our um, own discrimination factors. Because we use these discrimination factors to understand who's eating whom in the food web. And so here um, are the data. Um, we have carbon on the x-axis and nitrogen on the y-axis. Um, and then we have the two habitats. So we have coral rubble and seagrass. And then all of these yellow dots are the coral rubble mantis shrimp, stable isotope values of the coral rubble mantis shrimp. And then all of these um, blue dots are the seagrass mantis shrimp. And then we have the means and standard deviations of all the different prey collected from both habitats. And so the first thing you can see from these graphs is that mantis shrimp are not falling all that close to hard shell prey. So um, this indicates that perhaps hard shell prey are not as an important part of the diet as we thought. Um, but we really want to know uh, what the proportion of different prey are in the diet. And so we can use these mixing model analyses of diet um, and, and I used um, ones based on Bayesian statistics to understand the proportional contribution of each prey in the diet, each prey item to the diet. And so and the reason why Bayesian statistics is really helpful is because it allows you to put in prior information into your model in order to understand um, your results. So we did that. Um, we basically, with, we basically, um, from the literature, 
kind of decided that um, for that that mantis shrimp were um, kind of uh, four times more likely to eat a hard shell prey item. This was just kind of based on a reading in the literature. Um, and so we forced mantis shrimp to be hard shell prey specialists. Um, and then we also had a prey abundance prior. And so I put all of the abundance data that I gathered before into the model to inform that as well. And so hard shell prey is in dark gray and soft body prey is in light gray. Here, there was so much more hard shell prey than there was soft body prey. You can't really see it, but the distribution is very shifted towards hard shell prey. So both of these should kind of, you think, favor the result to be for hard shell prey. And then we had a no information or um, we, we, we ran the model without any information, which we call a generalist prior because these models generally then give all prey equal weights. So this is kind of if man shrimp were to eat, consume all prey the same amount. Um, and these are the results for the generalist prior. So both in both habitats, they seem to eat a lot of clams. Surprisingly, they also seem to eat a lot of fish. Um, and if we compare this to the priors where we put in prior information, uh, we actually see a very similar result. So even when we force a mantis shrimp to be a hard shell prey specialist, and even when um, the data kind of tell us that hermit crabs and snails and, clam and, um, and crabs are really abundant, um, really, they're still consuming a lot of fish and a lot of clams. And I think this is actually because they are actively capturing fish prey that swim by their little coral rubble cavities. Um, and I also know that these clams live usually underneath the same coral rubble cavities that these animals live in. And so I think these animals are, mantis shrimp are quickly kind of darting out of their cavities to grab a clam prey or they're just um, subduing a fish prey. And I think those prey are probably more accessible than the other prey. And so this told us, this work told us that specialized feeding morphology actually broadens the diet of a smasher. Um, and that the smashing mantis shrimp is probably a generalist prior, a predator that can consume a wide diversity of prey. It's probably just consuming what's close to its home so that it doesn't lose its home. Um, it just basically wants to stay in its little coral rubble cavity. So now we understand a little bit more about the trophic dynamics of the system in terms of what mantis shrimp are consuming. What about when we put it in the con put a smashing mantis shrimp with a spearing mantis shrimp that consumes something very different? Um, so this is Gump South Pacific Research Station run by UC Berkeley and Maria French Polynesia. And if you put on a mask and go for a snorkel, you'll see um, a lot of corals and coral rubble here. And so if you collect this coral rubble, take a look inside, you'll find a lot of these teeny little mantis shrimp. So these are much smaller than um, the mantis shrimp we were talking about before. They're about half the size. Um, this is Gonodactylus childi, and this is Ral Serenia morea. And this is really unique because this is one of the only places in the world where we find a smasher and a spear living in the same habitat. Usually I told you we find smashers and hard uh, substrates, spears and soft bodied substrates, uh, soft substrates. Here we see them living together in the same habitat, which is really neat because then habitat is kind of no longer a co-variable. We can really compare the two diets. And so um, here I'll show you the results from this Bayesian mixing analysis this is the same thing that I did before, um, except now we see the spear is in yellow and the smasher is in blue. Um, and I will also say because I could, did not have experimentally derived discrimination factors or because I didn't have prior information to put into, into the model, I ran this with I ran the model with experiment, my experimentally derived discrimination factors and with ones from the literature, and I came up with very similar results. Um, and I'm just showing you the experimentally derived one, exper discrimination factor results. Um, but again, the take home here is that the smasher, when it's in the presence of the spear, does consume fish, uh, but it's consuming a lot more clams probably. 
And here we see the reverse where the sphere is consuming mostly fish. Um, and it's not really consuming any of these other hard shell prey items. So it seems that in the presence of a, of a spear, the smasher is actually kind of limited to a diet of hard shell prey because it's not as good of a competitor for um, soft bodied evasive prey. It doesn't have that same reach. Um, and so I think both species are probably consuming a diversity of prey regardless of their appendage morphology, but the morphological specialization allows species to consume otherwise inaccessible prey. And the diets of these species are likely a result of consistent competition for prey. Um, so that's probably driving the evolution of these two really impressive movements. Okay, so now we understand a little bit more about feeding interactions and how it relates to trophic dynamics, at least in terms of um, what mantis shrimp are consuming. How does this relate to the environment? Um, and how does environment potentially shift these really important form function relationships? And so I have focused primarily on um, climate change and how climate change might alter form function relationships. Um, we know in particular that ocean acidification, which is a result of climate change, um, can really affect calcified structures. Um, and so corals, mollusks, foraminifera um, have all been shown to produce kind of weaker, um, thinner calcified structures. Crustaceans, which is what a mantis shrimp is, um, on the other hand, has been, they've been shown to kind of uh, have a different response to ocean acidification. Some of them have a neutral response and some of them actually grow thicker shells because they can, they build their exoskeleton in a different way than, than shells are made by snails and other mollusks. Um, and so we wanted to know how feeding morphology changes in response to decreased pH and increased temperature in mantis shrimp um, because, as I told you before, mantis shrimp are so dependent on their exoskeleton to be able to produce their imp impressive strikes. So all of the elastic energy storage is housed in the exoskeleton. And so if the exoskeleton is affected by changes due to climate change, um, their, their feeding morphology will be drastically um, affected as well. Uh, and so, yeah, here again is the diagram that I showed you before, um, illustrating the importance of the exoskeleton to generating these fast, powerful movements. And so, again, with ocean acidification, we'll see a decrease in pH, but we'll also see, um, with climate change, probably an increase in ocean temperature. And so we really wanted to understand how this interaction between pH and temperature could affect mantis shrimp morphology and feeding mechanics. And so this was the experimental setup that we had at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And these were the two undergraduates who helped me with this work. This was during my postdoc. Um, Victoria Morgan, who's now a PhD student at um, UC Davis, and Grace Chan, who's a PhD student at UC Irvine. Um, both studying crustaceans and climate change in some way, which is pretty neat. Um, and so we had three treatments. We had ambient, low pH, low pH, and high temperature in these Keter tanks, and the water flowed down to these individual mantis shrimp cups. We had 72 mantis shrimp that were all experiencing these treatments for um, three to six months. We had a three-month period where we tested some of the animals, and then we had a six-month period where we tested the rest of the animals. And so we looked at exoskeleton structure and mineral composition. And we particularly looked at the murus, the mural segment of the appendage, which again is the main place where the exoskeleton houses the um, elastic en energy um, elements, storage elements. Um, and then we also looked at the dactyl, but I'm not gonna talk too much about those results today, um, but you guys are free to ask questions. Um, but the dactyl is the smashing surface of the appendage. And then we compared these two kind of more specialized exoskeletal structures to the carapace, which we consider to be more of like a generalized exoskeleton structure that's just kind of used for um, protection. And so here are the results from mineral composition. We looked at calcium because obviously these calcium carbonate structures are built from a lot of calcium. Um, and I told you that we sampled animals 
at three months and at six months, and here's the carapace data and here's the MIRAS data, and we actually saw no significant differences between treatments in calcium. We also looked at magnesium because magnesium is thought to be important for stabilizing um, amorphous calcium carbonate. Um, and it's also thought to be very affected by ocean acidification. And so we actually saw in magnesium, no significant difference between treatments. Although I will say that here at six months in the MIRAS, there was a slightly elevated level of magnesium which indicates that potentially mantis shrimp are shunting more magnesium to their mirrors to help stabilize the, um, the elastic um, energy storage capacity of the mirrors. Um, then we wanted to know whether or not these differences were gonna to translate to material properties. And so um, we can look at the hardness and the stiffness of a material with this machine here called the nano indenter. Um, so the nano indenter basically applies a known force to a material and then it tells us how hard um, the material is, so how resistant it is to permanent deformation and, or how stiff the material is, how um, resistant it is to temporary deformation. Um, and this is my undergraduate at the time, Summer Webb, um, who helped with this research and she is now um, a PhD student at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where we were for this work, um, doing really neat work, very similar to this on tuna crabs. Um, and so here are the material properties data, here are the hardness data and the stiffness data. Um, and again, we saw no, no significant differences in material properties between treatments, only a change in the carapace over time, where the carapace got harder and stiffer over time. Um, interestingly, the mirrors just kind of stays the course. It doesn't really change. Um, and so all of these results kind of tell us that mantis shrimp are probably going to be more tolerant to future ocean conditions, which is, which is pretty neat. Um, and so they, this can have a number of ramifications, um, but it may mean that they're able to exploit less tolerant hard shell prey um, that are predicted to break more easily in future ocean conditions. So um, um, crabs, hermit crabs, um, or I should say snails and other mollusks um, and uh, are predicted to, and have been shown to have much than our weaker shells. Um, and so either mantis shrimp are going to have a much easier time consuming these prey, or these prey are just not gonna do as well in, future, um, in our future ocean, and they will consume mostly these other prey. And so that could really change the feeding ecology and the dynamics, the trophic dynamics of the whole ecosystem. Um, and so the general take home messages from this body of work is that specialized morphology kind of has two ecological ramifications. It can either broaden diet as we saw, um, as, uh, as we see with um, mantis shrimp. And then also I didn't tell you about the cichlid fish, um, which has incredibly specialized morphology to even um, consume the scales off of the left side of another fish. Um, but it seems to consume a diversity of prey as well. Um, and Galapagos finches, it turns out, also consume a diversity of different food types um, when their main food source is, is not accessible. And so um, specialized morphology can give access to these inaccessible prey um, when, that's the, then, when that's the only thing available. Um, then, of course, we know that specialized morphology can potentially limit diet, as we talked about before, but I, but I'm, I think that perhaps um, we have new techniques now for understanding and learning about um, how prey contributes to a predator's diet, and so perhaps these other organisms um, that we think are specialized consumers actually have much wider diets than we realize. I think another thing that we learned is that mantis shrimp may be really important trophic links between the macroinvertebrates in the intertidal and larger coral reef predators. And so here are um, 
all of the little prey that mantis shrimp consume, but we also know that mantis shrimp are consumed by a diversity of predators from lionfish to octopuses to groupers. And so I think that they really are really important links between kind of the coral rubble reef flat that I showed you and the broader coral reef community. And so from our broad questions from before, we learned that, feed, we learned that feeding specialization um, connects mantis shrimp to wide diversity of organisms in the food web. And mantis shrimp are probably tolerant to future ocean conditions, which may impact abundances and distributions of prey. So now we understand how this small feeding interaction kind of fits into the broader context of trophic dynamics and environment. Um, and we know that morphology and behavior can inform broad ecological theory. Trophic dynamics of cryptic fauna are, are um, potentially really important drivers of ecosystem function because here we had this little mantis shrimp that people really didn't know anything about. And it turns out that they're probably a really important predator in the coral reef ecosystem. And then we see that there are probably shifts in feeding abilities and trophic dynamics with climate change. And so to kind of understand these broader ideas a little bit more, I'm starting to look at mantis shrimp from another perspective. And so mantis shrimp are of course, of course one of many little animals that live in a huge coral reef ecosystem. So you'd probably find this small smasher in a hole like this in a coral reef habitat. Um, but there are many other little holes and crevices in a coral reef and there are tons of other animals living in it. The estimate of um, species diversity on a coral reef is anywhere from 1 million to 9 million, an incredibly broad range. Um, and a lot of that is because most of these animals are living inside the coral reef matrix itself. itself. So the coral reef is a huge three-dimensional structure um, filled with tunnels and crevices, and we hardly know anything about what's happening in that coral reef ecosystem inside the reef. And so um, for part of my postdoc at Scripps Institute of Oceanography, um, I worked with engineers at um, UC San Diego School of um, Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering. And I worked with them to develop a robot that would be able to look inside coral reef crevices. And this is our first prototype. This is still a work in progress. Um, but we basically put a GoPro on the end of a sock and we, um, basically turn that sock in, this robot turned the sock inside out um, into the reef. Uh, and in this case, into this kind of fake little reef that we had created. Um, and that way it can kind of take on all of the tunnels and crevices inside the reef. Um, and to supplement this, I uh, also went to Maui um, and with a GoPro on a selfie stick and then also a pH temperature sensor um, in this contraption here, I was able to like probe inside the reef and see who's living in the reef and document um, environmental parameters that we haven't really begun to look at yet inside the coral reef. And we're just starting to look at those data, but it does seem like the internal environment of the reef and who lives there is quite different than what's on the surface, as you can imagine. Um, and so this is another big question that's guiding my current work, is who lives inside these cryptic habitats and what roles do they play? Um, also, now that I am based here in California at San Jose State University, um, I'm very excited to be looking at these broader questions um, in local habitats as well. And so um, to really understand whether shifts in feeding abilities and trophic dynamics um, happen with climate change, I'm starting to look at um, kelp forests and specifically the interaction between kelp forests and um, urchins. Most of you um, probably heard, know are aware of the story um, of how incredibly devastating urchins can be to kelp forest communities. They have this um, jaw structure here called the Aristotle's Lantern that is incredibly good at chomping through um, kelp holdfast and basically wiping out entire um, kelp ecosystems. And so um, I'm really interested in to know how urchins will respond to future ocean conditions and if they'll kind of be able to maintain this ability to consume um, uh, kelp forests in the way that they do. Um, 
and to start looking at this work with the undergraduate who I talked about before, Summer Webb, um, we looked at how food abundance can change um, the morphology of the Aristotle's lantern. And it turns out that in times of starvation, um, er urchins are able to kind of maintain their Aristotle's lantern and they're still able to be voracious predators um, or voracious consumers. So, um, but the next step is to understand how um, climate change, oceanification and warming may um, alter their ability to, to do this. I'm also starting to, this is a very new project, but starting to look at shifts in feeding abilities and trophic dynamics um, in uh, the bay here in the San Francisco Bay. And so I'm very curious to know how estuarine species cope with large pH fluctuations, because as you know, in an estuary, you can have pH fluctuations, um, very wide fluctuations on a daily basis. Um, and, and so we can look at these animals that have to experience this change daily to maybe understand how organisms in the future um, may adapt to ocean acidification and ocean warming. And so here's an example. So I'm going to, um, here's an example of this. So I'm very interested to compare responses of an invasive Asian clam. Um, this is actually one of the most invasive species in the world, um, considered to be one of the most invasive species in the world, um, and compare its response to um, pH and temperature um, compared to these two native clams. Um, and so, and here is an example from earlier this summer um, of stations around the bay that are monitoring pH and temperature. So you can see kind of in one snapshot how varied these values are. We go everywhere from 7.5 up in this north part of the bay uh, to 7.9, um, not very much further away. So um, it's pretty interesting to know how um, these animals respond to these daily fluctuations. And so again, I think all of this work um, really kind of culminates in these three broad questions um, and kind of on the fundamental level, understanding how feeding interactions are influenced by tro or influence trophic dynamics and how trophic dynamics and environment can influence each other as well. Um, yeah, with that, I will take questions. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you. I really appreciate how much you called out. Well, you work with a lot of undergrads and you called out where they are now, which is really fantastic. Uh, you are obviously inspiring a lot of them to go on. That's great. Um, so we have a question. It starts off really interesting research. Uh, do you think that the unique discrimination factor you found for mantis shrimp extends to other crustaceans and other invertebrate groups? Great question. Um, thanks. And uh, no, I do not. I think that um, I think that uh, these trophic discrimination factors um, in the literature have been treated very much as like. Um, this is what, this, this is just what it is for crustaceans and this is what it is for mollusks and this idea that you are what you eat plus three parts per mil for nitrogen and you are what you eat for carbon is like very um, kind of fixed, a fixed idea in the literature. Um, but I do think over the past 10, 20 years, people are starting to realize that these experimentally derived discrimination factors are really important because there is so much variation. Um, uh, even between species. And that's why I was hesitant to use the experimentally derived factors for the other mantis shrimp species. Ideally, I would have done that experiment again for those other mantis shrimp species that, you know, is of course, it's a very time consuming experiment. So um, that's why it's great that we can use these Bayesian methods um, and other methods to kind of ground truth um, experimental and literature values of discrimination because so many people use literature values, often it's their only choice. Um, so I think ground truth, truthing the result is important too. I have a question for you. When you said um, the mantis shrimp were eating what was close by, the clams or the fish, 
you sort of implied that maybe they were either um, holding on to their cavity because the competition for cavities was great. Or then I also thought, but in a coral reef, you could easily get eaten. I wonder if you looked at or thought about the conflicting factors. And I will say there's um, a group at Shoals out of Dartmouth, uh, Mark Landry's lab, who does a lot of work on hermit crabs and the scarcity of their shells. And there's some really cool behavior around that. And I wondered what's known about that for mantis shrimp? Probably nothing, I don't know. Yeah, no, great question. Um, and I'm a, a little bit familiar with the Landry work, so that's great. Um, yeah, great analogy. Um, what I kind of alluded to but didn't really say is that we know from a lot of work in the 70s and 80s that, um, that cavities are really hard to come by for mantis shrimp. And so there is a lot of competition for cavities and mantis shrimp is really neat, especially these smashers. They, um, they find a little cavity and a piece of coral rubble and then they actually like um, smash it to make kind of a perfect little hole for, for themselves. Um, and so they, um, they really kind of put a lot of effort into making these coral rubble cavities. And so to lose one is a really big deal because you will quickly be outcompeted for it uh, or it'll just be kind of taken from you. Um, but there is also a lot of active competition. So management are constantly fighting each other um, for these cavities as well. And that's actually an alternative explanation for the evolution of the powerful mantis shrimp strike is that they're actually beating each other up um, constantly over these cavities. Um, so, right. And so that's why it's advantageous to stay close to home to get food, I think. Yeah, that's cool. Thanks. Um, here's another question. How different is the morphology of the mantis shrimp from their sister group? And who is their sister group? And uh, sort of second question is how do they subdue the fish prey? Uh, great. Okay. Yes, I did not go too much into the fish prey. Um, so mantis shrimp, their uh, sister group is um, actually all of their decapods. So they split off from all of their crustaceans pretty much, um, but they're most closely related to duck pods. Um, but that was about 400 million years ago. So they've kind of been doing their own thing for 400 million years. Um, they, um, they, they're, there's one species of mantis shrimp here in California, um, which is strategic for me, but the California mantis shrimp actually has appendage morphology that we call transitional. So it looks like a a cross between a smasher and a spear. And that is actually the mantis shrimp that looks most like fossil mantis shrimp. So it doesn't have a bulb here, but it's not as elongated as the spear. Um, and so that is the appendage that we think most of the um, mantis shrimp up until about 65 million years ago had. And then about 65 million years ago is when you see this split between um, spears and smashers start to evolve. Um, and I should say that spears evolved first, actually really more about um, 250 million years ago, and then smashers evolved about 65 million years ago. And they're nested within spears, if you're interested. Um, how do they subdue fish prey? Um, yeah, so they really, um, just like the video, they um, try to capture it between the, um, the dactyl and the propotus segments. And um, so they, a lot of them have these sharp spines here in the propotus. Um, and then this, this spear that I showed you um, actually has movable spines with muscle connections up here, like on its elbow. So it uses these movable spines to um, subdue the prey as well. So they're really just literally spearing them with all of their spikes. And, um, and, and then, you know, I guess if the prey is still alive, then they do bring it to their maxilla heads and kind of continue to subdue it that way. That's awesome. <laughs> All right, well, it looks like uh, that's our questions. Thank you so much for answering our questions and for that fabulous talk. Um, really appreciate it. So um, for everyone on the call, our next um, talk is next Tuesday, the 15th at 7.30. And Robin havlak uh former Shoals faculty and researcher, and Nate Hamilton from the University of Southern Maine are gonna kick off a three-part series on Shoals 
human history and they're, um, they do archeological work in the shoals. So some really cool work about um, the fishing communities that were there in the 1600s, which has some very cool ecological stories around cod, especially, which I think Robin will be sharing with us. So, so please uh, tune in for that. All of this information about what talks are coming up through December is on our website, shoalsmarinelaboratory.org. And if you would like, you could also make a donation if you want to support us there as well. So thank you so much, Maya, for joining us. Thank, thank you, everyone, you. for attending. We appreciate it very much. Have a great night.